There was a, there was a young man, and uh, he lived at home with his mother, though, though he was a grown man. And his mother came in on Sunday, and she said, son, you've got to get up. You've got to go to church. And he said, no, nah, leave me alone. He pulled the covers. And she came back in a few minutes later. She said, son, you've got to get up. It's time to go to church. And he said, mom, leave me alone. And he pulled the covers over again. She came in three or four more times, always saying the same thing. You got to get up. And he says, I don't want to go. And she said, you have to go. And he was exasperated. He sat up and he said, why? Give me one good reason why I got to go. She said, you're the preacher. <laughs> so when I realize I'm going to talk to you about hypocrisy, I don't want to go. I don't want to do this. Um, this is a hard one to hear, right? Nod your head, yes. So I'm going to thank you up front for listening and hanging in from the front all the way to the back. It's an important one. It was, it was important to Jesus, as Sean pointed out, very important. Matter of fact, uh, Yada, Yada she, she referenced uh, uh, Matthew 23, 13. You ought to go there because seven times in 2013, and this doesn't happen very often, down through these verses, he repeats the same phrase over and over and over again. And the phrase is, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law, you Pharisees, hypocrites. He says that in 23.13, in 23.15, in 23.23, in 23.25, in 23.27, in 23.29. Says it to him over and over and over again. And each time he calls him a hypocrite, he tells him why. One time it's because they're taking people who are interested in in uh, spiritual things and leading them the wrong direction. One time, it's because they do everything for show. Another time, it's about their tradition. He goes all the way through it, and then he gets down to verse 33, and he says, you're snakes, you're sons of vipers. How will you escape the judgment of hell? <laughs> you know, I read that, and I think, okay. Um, when you think about things that Jesus was very firm on, you have to understand that hypocrisy was one of the big ones. And it's interesting to me because it's also kind of the main reason why the, the people give uh, for not coming to know Christ. When you share the gospel with someone, there are generally two reasons that people refuse the gospel. The first one uh, is usually they don't think they're worthy of it because they know about their whole lives, and they might have given you a lot of excuses, but at the end of the day, when they're thinking about it alone, they are so wrapped up in their own lives and thinking about who they are, and they feel incapable of ever being a Christian. Why? Because they have a standard. They have an expectation of what Christians should live like. And, uh, and, and that's the second reason that people refuse Christ. They have seen that standard violated over and over and over and over again by Christians. I'm real familiar with it. I'm real familiar with it. Because the number one thing, the number one accusation that comes back to me all the time, over and over and over, I can't tell you how many times, is you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. I, I hear it said to me over and over and over. Sadly, it's coming from in here, not from out there. Which means only one thing. It's probably the Holy Spirit expressing something to me that's important. All of us will do hypocritic things in our lives. Can't help it. You're, you're going you're gonna to behave one way. That's why grace is so wonderful. That's why it's so exciting. Because no matter how hypocritical you are, if you know Jesus, you're saved by grace and not by your behavior. But Jesus certainly does change, uh, give us the, the idea that once you are changed, once you are saved, there ought to be a change in your behavior. There ought to be a, a, a do better. And so, in a sense, the whole idea of hip, hypocrisy that Jesus gives us is about that change. Now, let me give you a little idea of the etymology of where the word came from, uh, to be a hypocrite. It came originally through uh, Greek tragedy. Back in the day, before the printing press, 
before they had any way to write anything down or talk about any kind of poetry, uh, people would act out and they would use those masks. You've seen them. And that's from Greek tragedy. And one actor would do all the parts. It just depended on what kind of mask. And he'd walk across with the first one and he'd say funny things and the audience would laugh. And when he got over here, he'd grab the second one and hold it up and he would say tragic things. And the people would almost even cry. And it was the beginning of Greek theater. Donna and I were in theater together. That's where I first met her in California. I was a theater geek. And uh, I, I, I was a thespian. I was also on the baseball team. And there were times I had to run to baseball with makeup on. And that, that, that really confused the coach. Okay, And this was back in the day when you weren't politically collect, correct, so you can only imagine what he called me. And, uh, and, and the ball players dared me at the, at the first game of the year. I got all my catching gear on. They dared me to kiss him because <laughs> of what he'd called me. And so he gave us a rah-rah, you know. And, and he, here's something I got to tell you about ball players. Don't ever dare them or double dare them. They'll do stupid <laughs> things. No matter. And so he finished his little talk, and I jumped up and gave him a big kiss on the cheek. And we ran out to the, and the guys are laughing. It's funny, right? And uh, the whole game, the coach was like this. <laughs> but the first time I really paid attention to Donna, she had to do a, a Greek tragedy monologue. And, uh, and it was about Jason, and I think the queen's name was Othea, and she was an awful person. And she, she was mad at him, so she killed his children. And so Donna's up there with this really cute little uh, West Virginia accent, and she said, Oh, thou Jason, I've killed your children. <laughs> That's what I did. I laughed out loud. <laughs> she broke character and got a really low grade. And, uh, and, and that's the way I met her. That's how we really started getting together, uh, me, me making a fool of her. So I, we've been married almost 52 years. Uh, matter of fact, tomorrow is our 52nd wedding anniversary. Right. And I'll be in trouble because I told you that little story <laughs> about a little West Virginia girl. So, when I was a Californian, okay, you, you can't hold it against me. Back then, I was living in a foreign country and was out of my mind. So I can't be held accountable for anything that happened to me. I was a native Californian. So, it is, uh, it, what, it, it, what hypocrisy is, it's the practice of claiming to be moral and have moral standards or beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform. So it's like a pretense. You show something and you do something completely different. And you know what happens many times in the church. It happens many times from up here. As a matter of fact, the, the French say there are three sexes. They say there's male, female, and preachers. Uh, because they view preachers in such a different category. And how often throughout my family, I grew up in a, in a non-Christian home, and my grandfather told me every preacher he knows anything about is a hypocrite. And now that's not true, but it's true enough that people who are lost will say it over and over and over again. And we keep presenting this, this hypocrisy out to the world, and we expect the world to warm up to the message of Jesus when they can't trust us to show them that message. It's about an expectation. Matter of fact, there's a kind of a new phrase that's going around uh, that a lot of people are, are talking about. They say, well, is the person you know an authentic Christian? I have a dear friend who says that a lot. June Hunt says that a bunch. And when she first would say it to me, I'd say, well, June, anybody that's accepted Jesus is an authentic Christian. She goes, no, no, no. I'm talking about an authentic Christian. Christian. And I was trying to get her to explain that to me. And here's, here's what I got. Best explanation is conforming to an original so as to uh, reproduce essential features made or done by the same as the original. 
Do you look like Jesus or not? Do you behave like Jesus or not? Are you his and does it show? Not, not a false or an imitation thing that you do, but a real true to one's own personality, spirit, and the character of God. You know, a lot of people don't understand the Holy Spirit, the person part of the Holy Spirit. Everybody thinks about the Holy Spirit in a different way. I remember we were doing an ordination of some young guys in seminary, and, uh, and we were talking to them about their belief system, because you have to have that down before you'll get ordained. And one of them called the Holy Spirit an it. Well, I thought Jack Graham was going to throw him out of the room. An it? What are you talking about? It's a person. But you know what? A lot of us don't get who the person of the Holy Spirit is. Third person of the Trinity, of course. But the Holy Spirit is the actual character and nature of God. It is God's personality. And by God's design, when you get saved, God plants his personality in you. One of the major ministries of the Holy Spirit as he comes into your life at the point of salvation is that you get the very nature and character of God. Why do you think we talk about how powerful the Holy Spirit is? It's the very character and nature of the Lord Jesus Christ living in you. And so when you cut that off and you begin to act in a hypocrisy way, the world gets confused. Are you, are you a Christian or are you not? A, there's a great story about Alexander the Great. You know, and if you were in Alexander the great, Great's army and, and you faded on him and you, you ran back when they, you know, when they weren't talking about retreat, if you retreated, they'd kill you. Because his army never retreated, they kept moving forward. And this one young boy ran off during the battle, he got scared, young guy, and he just dropped his weapon and he ran away. Well, the soldiers brought him to Alexander to be, you know, to be killed. And he stood before Alexander and he, he asked the boy, he said, what is your name? And the boy said, Alexander. He said, what'd you say? He said, sir, my name is Alexander. And it said that Alexander the Great stood the boy up and looked him right in the eye, and he said, Your name is Alexander? He said, I ought to kill you, but instead I'm going to tell you either live up to your name or die. Right? Sometimes as Christians, we just need to be lifted up and stood up and kind of shook. Kind of, you know, just... Did your dad ever do that to you? Just grab you and, you know... Little Stevie was so ADD, you know, we'd be in a restaurant and something, and all of a sudden, man, I'm right there, my dad's got me, and he's shaking me, you know, and I'm feeling my brain do this. <laughs> this is probably what happened. <laughs> but it was his way to get me to focus. Sometimes in the Christian world, we just need to be shook up, just need to be grabbed, picked up, shaken, wake up. This is important. And instead, sometimes we have to just keep understanding and hearing in our head, what a hypocrite, what a hypocritical thing you just did, what a hypocritical thing you just said. And some of you don't even know it. Some of you don't even notice. There are people, I call them legalist, which for me is a bad name. They got a set of standards, they got a set of rules, they got a set, they're the Pharisees. You go by this, you do this, you do that, you better do it right. If you don't do it right, mm, man, you do not fit. You're, you're, you're not in this organization. You can't do it right. And, and, and so that's the idea. The idea is a legalist many times by their very nature is a hypocrite. Not talking about the grace of God. Not talking about who he is. There's a little girl who had lived on the street had been selling her body, and she went, decided one day she's going to go into church, and she walked into church, and the preacher took her aside, and he explained to her that her dress did, was not appropriate for church. And if she was going to come to his church, she needed to get her dress appropriate, go home, get your dress appropriate. Between one week and the next, she had read the scripture, and she had come to know Jesus as her personal Savior, and she went back to that church dressed the same exact way. 
And the preacher approached her again. He said, young lady, I told you, do not come into my church dressed like that. And you came back dressed exactly the same way. She said, yeah, I know what you said. But what I read in scripture said that my God loves me just like I am. So are you going to preach the true God or are you going to stay with your rules and regulations? It's a good question. It's a great question. So Jesus is teaching and, uh, and he's, he's, he's uh, talking about giving to the needy in Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. This is how important hypocrisy is. In the Sermon on the Mount, he brings it up and preaches about it for several verses. And, and he's, he's, warning, he's warning all those who might be believers. He says, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you, give, so when you give to someone in need, don't do it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets and, and sounding cymbals on the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all their, all their reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gift in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Now, what he's talking about is something they had seen. They had seen this is the way the Pharisees would do it. When they got ready to give, and they'd blow a trumpet. Yeah, you think you guys gave something. Here's a big deal coming. Take their purse, put it on top of their head, drop it in a plate so it'd make a big noise. They had a horn-like thing, a big horn, and, and the money would kind of go down. You'd drop your shekels in, and you could kind of tell what somebody gave if they threw it in the horn, and you'd hear it go down, sound like one little piece of change. Just kind of ding, 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 ding. And when the Pharisees would come up, they would, you know, <laughs> pay attention. And this thing would go on and on and make a whole bunch of noise. And they were standing there like, there we go. I have done this. I see people do this. You go to charity dinners, and they stand people up, and they reward them publicly. And I think, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. If the nonprofit is worth it, please don't do that. Don't, don't let people stand up and pridefully take their public reward, because that's it. That's, that's the reward right there, whatever that is. And psychologists tell us that lasts about eh, 30 seconds or so, and then it's gone. Well, the greater reward is what you do in secret, what you give to the Lord and nobody knows. How you, how you take care of somebody and nobody knows anything about it. You just pay it forward in a way. You just are nice about it. You just do it and go on because that's what God told you to do. When was the last time God told you to do something and you just did it? And didn't tell anybody about it. See, more and more of that ought to be happening in our lives. And, you know, God, God moved on your heart and you saw that little waitress and she probably didn't wait on you very well because she's waiting on too many other people and you just kind of laid down more money and you should have laid down. Maybe a lot more. So that's, that shows Christ to people. When people begin to see us do things and we don't do them for all the glory, we don't stand up and look what I did. Look at the big thing I did. I remember talking about taking the glory. Don and I were at a, we were at a big fundraiser for Special Olympics, and they brought out these two dogs, um, and they're those kind of dogs that they take a poodle and they blend it with a, a golden retriever. What do they call those? Uh, yeah, they were two of those. Uh, what kind of, what, what kind of? Golden Doodle, that's what they called them. So they had two Golden Doodles. And it was back when they were really expensive. I think they still are. And they had these two Golden Doodles, and they, they started the bidding, you know. And, and these, these two guys were sitting at our table. We, we were at a table with Zig Ziglar, and so we're at the front table, and these two big shots are sitting at the front table. And, and uh, all of a sudden, the bids start coming. You know, $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. Boom, boom, boom. Big money. I think it got up to about $5,000. And, uh, and uh, one guy from the, the guy that's doing the, the auctioneer, he leans over to these two guys. He said, you two realize that's your kids bidding against each other, right? 
And they went, what? <laughs> and here came the next bid, 6,000, 7,000. And so these two guys stopped. <laughs> and they got up and, of course, they gave one dog to one kid, one dog to the other kid, and these two guys split the seven grand. And, and it, it was fun. But I thought, well, there goes your reward. You didn't get to do that in secret, but that wasn't your fault. But it was fun. <laughs> so notice he teaches on giving. The second thing he starts teaching about is he starts teaching about prayer, or, or uh, prayer and fasting. And that's in Matthew 5 through 8 when he says, and when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. He doesn't even call them Pharisees now. He's called, just call them hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. And I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself and shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. And then your father who sees everything will reward you. And when you pray, don't babble on and on as the, as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your father knows exactly what you need, even before you ask him. God knows what your need is. And so often our prayers are mostly about our need. You know, I like you to follow the, the, the acts kind of prayer. If you think of the word acts and you'll think uh, the A stands for adoration and the C stands for confession and the T thanks, uh, stands for thanksgiving and the S stands for supplication. Most of us go into prayer asking God for something. God give me this, give me that, give me this other thing. But if we'd come in just with adoration, just glorifying God and then confessing our sins to him, those two things will take a while. And then thanking him for what he's done and thanking him for what he's going to do in the future. Then when you finally get to supplication to that thing that you thought you really need, you may not need it any longer because God has answered your prayer and straightened out your life as you prayed to him. And he's saying, don't stand around like these guys. Have you ever heard somebody pray and you just thought, oh, man, I wish I could pray like that. Maybe you don't. I've heard guys pray. You know, they get up and, boy, the voice is big and loud. You know? I won't tell you who it was, but I was at a, I was at a big meeting. It's a pro-life deal. And they had a, the pastor get up to do, to do the prayer. And uh, he got up, and he had a nice, big voice. Well-known guy. I mean, big, biggie. Uh, and, and he started praying. And he prayed around the horn. Boy, he prayed about abortion, and he prayed about how wrong it was, and he prayed about this and about that. But it was the most condemning, shameful kind of prayer I had ever heard. I was sitting at a table with the White Rose people. For those of you who don't know, White Rose is the, uh, the, what, what the Catholics call their pregnancy centers, and they have White Rose places all over, and their pregnancy centers just like what we have, only they're led by Catholics. And so this little Catholic group was right there, and this man prayed loud and long, and he used big words, and he went on and on and on. And by the time he was done, you were just shamed. Just shamed. And when he said amen, I mean, he, and I, I mean, he insulted the speaker in the middle. <laughs> he, said, he said, God, I know the most important thing is not what our speaker is going to say, but what I'm saying to you is more important than anything else that's going to happen today. He went on and on and on. Finally, he got to amen. And that was the answer to my prayer. <laughs> and I looked up, and these little Catholic women are looking at me like... And so I looked at him, and I, I stood up, and I said, Ladies, for the, for the entire Protestant world, may I ask for forgiveness for that prayer? And they said, That's not normal? I said, I hope not. No, that's not normal. And so that's what he's saying. When you pray, do it that way. And when you fast, make sure you do it right. You know, the, the Pharisees would fast, and they'd put on, like, powder makeup. They'd make their face look white, and they'd walk around like, hadn't eaten for three weeks, making a big deal about it. When you fast, you're not supposed to tell anybody. Some people may find out because you say, no thanks. I don't, I don't need that right now. But you're not supposed to tell people, hey, I'm fasting. 
Whoo, I'm fasting. Uh, and they're, they're, they're Christians online making whole careers out of fasting. But I can't tell if they're fasting for spiritual reasons or for physical reasons. They just go on and on and on about the, you know, all of that. But the, the Pharisees used to make a big deal about their fasting and about their praying. So he says, when you pray, pray like this. And I don't like this interpretation. This is from the, the Living Bible. And, uh, and I like the Our Father who art in heaven better. Hallowed be thy name. May your kingdom come soon. May, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we, for, as, we forgive, as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. It, it, God covers it. That is the model prayer for the Christian. And if you look at it, it's exactly the Acts model. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Adoration. Confession. confession. May your kingdom come soon. And may your will be done on earth. And then he says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. Confession. And he thanks God throughout. And he, and he asks God to keep him from the evil one. And that's what he's presenting. Keep me from sin. Keep me from hypocrisy. God, help me recognize the hypocrisy before I'm in the middle of it, doing it. And, you know, so many times it's not that you were just kind of going along and all of a sudden you committed major acts of hypocrisy. These are habits. These are habits that these people have. And much of what you do in worship turns into a habit. Have you ever noticed? I mean, I watch you all when we sing. Some of you have better habits than others. Some jump right up and sing, get involved. Others of you kind of go, no, nah, I don't like that one. Care for that one. I'm not singing on that one. Okay, but pay attention to the words. Tell your face not to discourage the people up here who are singing. You know, the idea is to worship. The idea is to worship. If you can't worship on any song that we present up here from week to week, that John and the guys put together, if you can't worship to what we're doing, then, then, then your worship's in trouble. And, and it's, it's hypocritical to come to church and not worship. That's hypocrisy. We're to worship. I know, but that's not a song I like. So what? I'm going to say a lot of things you don't like. I'm in the middle of saying something you don't like. What are you going to do, walk out? No. Be hypocritical later and tell somebody, I didn't like that. Maybe. Maybe. But that's the idea. What he's saying is make it between you and God. Show your relationship is between him and you. And then publicly when we're together, you get to show it here. You get to, you get to love on people here. You get to be real here. One of the most shocking things, when I went into ministry, the, one of the most shocking things to me, I was sitting in my office and, and people that were on the staff would come in and said, sit down and they'd say, man, let me tell you what so-and-so did to me. And they tell me, and I go, what? They did that? Yeah. Man, what did they say when you told them? Oh, I hadn't told them. Why are you telling me? See, I was used to industry. Where I came from, if somebody didn't like something you did, they were square into your office going, hey, let me get up in your grill for a minute about this and that and the other. And you'd stand up and say, oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you this and that. But when you were done, you were told... See, a lot of times we think that's unholy. That's as holy as it gets. You got, you got something against your brother, go tell him. You got something against your sister, go tell him. Don't just fade into the background and everybody can figure, figure out from your attitude you're not happy. That's also hypocrisy, by the way. Mope around till somebody walks up and says, you okay? You all right? Something happened? Was somebody mean to you? I mean, I got empathy, but not for that. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You know, a bad attitude is hypocrisy. 
Why would a Christian have a bad attitude about anything that happened to him in life? Anything. Doctor report? Why would you have a bad attitude about that? I mean, you might be frightened. Might not be good, might be scary. But you have the attitude, you have the nature, the personality of Christ in you to deal with that. Somebody said something hurt your feelings, said something about you. Okay. Okay. Don and I went to a movie. It's about um, Christian contemporary music. And, uh, and uh, Michael W. Smith was telling a story. And it, and it, and it was about, um, what's her name, Donna? Amy Grant. Uh, Amy Grant was about to sing. Now, Amy Grant, you all know Amy Grant had a marriage, and her marriage ended, and then she began a marriage. I can't remember anybody's name today. Vince Gill. Just put it all in there. You know who's their, who's, who their name is. Uh, so, so she's about ready to walk on stage and sing, and she's got her guitar, you know, and she's in her bare feet like she always does, you know, and she's ready to go. And this pastor walked up, and he looked at her, and he said, you are a harlot. You are a wicked woman. What makes you think you can walk out on that stage and share Jesus to anybody? And Michael W. Smith said, man, I got so angry. He said, I wanted to get up and beat the guy. Well, Michael W. Smith's about this big, <laughs> first of all. So he, you know, he didn't, and he said he turned and, and he looked, and, and Amy Grant just looked at the man and she said, oh, dear brother, I'm far worse than those things. <laughs> far, far worse. I stand guilty of all of that. And she said, but you're reminding me, serves no purpose. And, uh, and, and I, I am forgiven and covered by grace. And even though you've said this to me, I'm going to walk out and share Jesus with all my heart, soul, and strength. And she walked out on stage. And I'm talking, yes, yes. That's a hypocrite going down in flames. So then he's teaching about forgiveness in 14 through 16. And he says, if you forgive those who sin against you, and your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's shocking to think about. He wants us to be a forgiving people. You know, one of the, one of the most hardest things in, in all of the world is sometimes to forgive another person, and yet we are called to do that. We are ordered to do it in Scripture, and it's difficult, and it is a process. So many people that I talk to in my office, I, I try to tell them, Forgiveness is something you need to do immediately because you're commanded to do it, but it doesn't mean that you reconcile. It doesn't mean that you open your arms and welcome that person back in. Reconciliation is another project. So what he's talking about is he's talking about forgiving others, not getting back into a relationship with them, but forgiving them. And he says, and, and so then when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they, for they look miserable and disheveled so that people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that it is, that is their only reward they will get. So he says it over and over again. You notice he attacks three pillars within, within the, the pharisaical life, if you will. There, there are three pillows, pillars of ministry. Was they put a great emphasis on giving. The Pharisees had a huge emphasis on giving. Matter of fact, a good Pharisee, are you ready? A good Pharisee would tithe about 35% of their income. Now, between you and me, I wouldn't mind having a couple Pharisees in the group when it comes to the giving. <laughs> 35%. And they would, but they would analyze it, and they would show it, and they would talk about it, and it became a thing. And it would be, hey, so Saul, how much you given this year? 26%. Hmm, ha, I'm giving 35. That's the way they talk about it. And so he attacks that pillar. And he attacks the pillar of prayer. That was a big deal. But it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal that they pray. They, they weren't interested in God. They were interested in being seen. They were, interesting in, they were interested in performing 
They weren't interested in finding the heart of God, hearing it, and then going out and doing what God told them to do. And then they were interested, terribly interested in fasting. And the fasting was done a certain way and it had certain rules to it. And they would do it all, but it was all for show. It was all it so people would just look at them and go, oh, and take their breath away. Aren't they religious? Yeah, they are. We're not talking about religion. Jesus never talked about religion except to criticize it. He talked about relationship. He talked about knowing him, loving him, being a part of him, accepting the Holy Spirit into your life and understanding that God has a wonderful, tremendous plan for your life. So in this sermon, he attacks all those things. And he shows them as hypocrites. And then later on in Matthew, matter of fact, Matthew 15, uh, Jesus is teaching about inner purity. And he goes on the attack again. But this time, he's attacking their traditions. Because along with the big three pillars that the Pharisees had, they had traditions. They had these things that were basically habits of things that they would do. And, and they wanted those account to be big account before God. That God's going to love me more because I keep this particular tradition. So Jesus teaches about inner, inner purity when he says, Some Pharisees and teachers of, of religious law now arrive from Jerusalem to see Jesus. And they ask him, Why do your disciples disobey the age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand washing before they eat. They walked in. They, they, were, they came from Jerusalem. First question. They wanted to see Jesus. Okay? And as they got there, they're in the investigation stage. They're just testing Jesus. They're trying to figure out what part of the religion is he not and holding up. And they said, let's, let's go after the hands deal because his disciples don't wash their hands. That doesn't mean that they didn't wash their hands. They didn't wash their hands in their tradition of how you're supposed to wash their hands. See, they had a tradition, and the tradition was in, in an amount of water that you would fill up an egg. If you busted an egg in half and put a little water in here, a little water in there, that's about how much water they would use. And you would pour this water on your hands, and your hands would be up like this. And you would let it drip down, and you would drop this part of your arm on the towel as it would drip down. And then with the second half, you would put your hands like this, and they would, you would wash them that way. And then with, with your fist, you would do this to dry them off. So you were ceremonially clean, and that was their tradition. And they wanted to know why his disciples didn't do all that. <laughs> At my house, food would be gone. If you took that much time to do this and then to do that, I mean, all the good pieces of chicken are gone before you got to them. And, and so Jesus says, and, and why do you by traditions violate the direct commands of God? Okay, that was not a shot over the bow. That was a direct hit. They ask him about a tradition about washing the hands, and he says, really? Yeah? Why do you violate the commandments of God? Why do you do that? And, I mean, that, that had to make them just back up. And no wonder they didn't like Jesus. <laughs> Everything they came up with, he would boom, right in the middle of them. And so the, the, this is a tradition gone bad. For instance, God says, and now he's going to give them an example of what they're doing, of what he's saying. He says, honor your father and mother. And, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. He's talking about the laws of Moses. Now Moses wrote 613 laws. You're most familiar with the Ten Commandments. This is out of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. And, and he's saying, well, if you don't honor your father and mother, Moses said, you ought to be put to death. If you're not nice to the old people, you should go die. And so, so he sang that to them, and he, and he says, uh, but you say it is all right for the people to say their, to their parents, sorry, I cannot help you, for I have vowed to give God what I would have given to you. 
in this way, you say they don't need honor. They're, you don't need to honor their parents. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. They had a thing called Korban. And Korban was, if you owned a bunch of stuff and the Pharisees were rich, they had lots of money, they had lots of possessions. And if you had stuff and you didn't want to give it to God, you didn't want to tithe on it, you would call it Korban. And you'd say, this table is Korban. That means this table has been vowed and dedicated to God. And God doesn't need a table, but that's the kind of stuff they would do. And so when the parents would come up the road because they're out of money and out of gas and don't have anywhere to stay, don't have anywhere to live, everything's gone for them, and they would come and the parents would say, hey, can you help us? Can you put us up? We raised you. They would honor their parents by saying, you know, mom and dad, we'd love to bring you into the big house, love to give you a room, love to share all this with you, but you know what? We got it all under Corban. It's all dedicated to God. So we can't. So sorry. Go, go find my sister. I mean, he's calling them on it. He's calling them on their tradition. He said, you got traditions, and the traditions have overruled what the law of Moses is. And what the traditions were, were all the things that they made up about the laws of Moses. So when Moses said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, you know, that's what he means. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Well, they would add so many things to that. And what it meant that by the time Jesus comes, it is ridiculous what all that meant. All of their, all of their Mishnah stuff and the Mishnah, it was their traditions, their addendums to the law. And they would just keep coming, coming and coming. And so he's saying, yeah, you're Korban. That, it dishonors your parents. And you're talking to me about my disciples washing their hands? So then it's tradition gone wrong in 15, 7 through 9. He said, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, those people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Those are about the harshest words that anyone could say. You might just read them off the page and, and, and wonder and think, well, was that really that bad? Yes. Yes, that is the highest criticism he could possibly give them. He said, you, you people claim to be the leaders of the law, you claim to be the man, men of Moses, and you're not. You're not. You're, you've taken your tradition. Your tradition has become more important in, to you than the law of God. And sometimes in church, the tradition of what it is we do becomes more important than loving Jesus. There's nothing more important than loving Jesus. Nothing. There's not anything we have or own that we can't get rid of, move around. We, we have to glorify God no matter what. But traditions become a hard thing. So, here's the application. Exposing hypocrisy is helpful to your walk with Christ. Exposing it. What does that mean? It means you've got to go inside yourself. Simple little prayer. God, can you show me my hypocritical ways and get ready? I mean, just hold on. Strap in. Can you show me my hypocritical ways? He will. It'll show up quick. Other people might voice them back to you. You might see them coming. And, and so it is helpful. Uh, practicing hypocrisy is natural. It's very human. You're not perfect. As a Christian, are you going to do hypocritical things? Yes, probably by the end of the day. It's going to happen. It's, it's good fodder for confession. It's a good kind of way to pray, God, what hypocritical thing am I involving myself in today? God will point it out to you. He'll put his finger on it. He'll go, there it is right there. You know that. There it is. See it. Look at it. Let it go. See it. Look at it. Let it go. It's natural. And then breaking from hypocrisy, is, hypocrisy will be painful. We get used to habits that we have. Habits of how we want to serve God. Habits of how we want to worship God. Habit, habits of what we want to say about God. How much we want to say and how much we don't want to say. 
We develop habits. And sometimes people will tell me, well, you know, I just, I'm just not a soul winner. I don't, I don't want to offend people. I don't want to bring up Jesus. That's a habit. You don't want to bring up Jesus. You know, the, the really bad part, the really awful part of hypocrisy is it cuts off the witness of Christ to the world. We'll survive it in the church. I mean, we do. There's been major hypocrisy committed from pulpits and different places, and church goes right on. I mean, it, God's people will survive it. Lost people can't. And they won't. That's what the woes were all about. Woe to you who forgot to share God. Woe to you who forgot to make God the main thing. Woe to you who have been given great responsibility and yet you've given it away so that you could have stuff, so that you could be religious, so that you could be well thought of, so that you'd be watched, so that people would applaud. Woe. 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 Chuck Swindoll tells a great story, and I was looking for a great story. When you go looking for one, get an old Chuck Swindoll book out, right? But he tells a story about a young boy and his family. World War II, they were Jewish, and uh, they were all taken from their city and put on a train, taken to the concentration camp. And then while at the concentration camp, they were taken out to a field, handed shovels to dig a grave. And then they were instructed to fall into the grave. And of course, the German shoulders just shot them all down, killed them all. And they made them all undress so they were completely naked. And they would stand in this grave that they had just dug, this ditch. And they came along and just gunned them down. And this little boy was part of his family, and they were in the process of doing that. And they gunned him down. Every bullet somehow missed this little boy, about 13 years old. And then uh, the soldiers come by, and they roughly throw a little bit of dirt over him so there was still enough room for him to breathe. And he waited for what seemed like hours to him before they all left, and he couldn't hear anybody. And then he dug his way out, and he was filled with blood all over him and dirty and nasty. And there was a little town at the bottom of the hill, and he ran down to the little town, and he knocked on the door. And as he knocked on the door, somebody came to the door, and they looked at him and with horror said, get away, get away. And he said, I, I need help, I need help. They said, get away. They slammed the door, door after door after door. And then one day, he knocked on a door, or that night, he knocked on this one door, and they opened the door, and the lady said, get away, and she slammed it. And he said, I am the Jesus that you love. Turning me away is turning away Jesus. I am the Jesus that you love. Third time he said it, the door opened. The woman took him in. They took him into their family and cleaned him, cared for him. And years later, the woman would tell that story and about how wonderful of a young man he grew up to be, and what a radiant Christian he grew up to be. Our hypocrisy is a closed door to the lost. Not just closed, but it's a slam in their face. The Jesus you love is them. The Jesus that you know is them. And when you have done something to the least of these, you've done it to him. Father, help us. Help us to identify the hypocrisy that we so easily engulf ourselves in that keeps people from knowing Jesus. Lord, we admit to great sin. And the sin is uh, hypocritical to you. And so, Father, I pray that you would just draw a circle around the things in our lives that are hypocritical in our behavior. 
And God, we thank you again that we're not saved by our behavior. We're saved by grace. But God, there is something in our behavior you long to help, you long to fix. And you've given us the power of the Holy Spirit to do so. So Father, I pray you would do a magnificent work in our hearts right now around our hypocritical behavior and that you would strengthen us to be able to lay it down and show Jesus in a better, more majestic way in Christ's name. Amen.